Dominica sets out to rebuild confidence in the economy after Roosevelt's carrot's victory in last week's election. The last day on the job for Mauricio Macri as Argentina prepares for a new president and a new direction. And five people are dead and more than 20 are missing after a volcano erupted on a tourist island in New Zealand. Hello and welcome to Telesur. I'm Doris Polo in Quito and this is From the South. We begin in Dominica, where life is getting back to normal after the tense election campaign last week. The Labour Party won a sweeping victory on Friday, giving Roosevelt Scarrett a third term as Prime Minister. All the observer missions, including that of the OAS, said the vote was free and fair. Let's go live to the capital, Rosso, and our correspondent, Alejandro. Kirk Alejandro, what is the mood like there in Rosso as life returns to normal after the elections? There is greetings from uh, the seaside, from the bay side, where the news today is that uh, this cruise ship uh, docked in this morning. This is a political statement in itself because it it's, um, it's a testimony of uh, the stability, tranquility and peace that is reigning in the country. These ships were coming in a, in a rate of about three to four a week and they stopped after the violence that was uh, ignited by the opposition right-wing party, the United Workers' Party. This is over. The victory was, like you said, so sweeping that and, and this, the, also the statements by the observer missions left no room for doubt about who won the elections and the elections were fair, free and fair. So uh, the city, the small town of uh, Rousseau is blooming again today. Vendors are selling their stuff uh, all uh, around the, uh, the, the ship, the, the, this um, bay side where many of them are putting up their tents. They're selling t-shirts, they're selling uh, food. The visitors are enjoying this, the island, touring it, going to the falls, uh, going to nature, which is, you know, the attractions of this island. And also this... Um, reinforcement of uh, self-assurance that the country is at peace and that uh, this important source of income for uh, Dominica uh, will keep uh, coming in and there will be no more disruptions. That is at least the hope that we have for now. Um, obviously, the conspiracy against Prime Minister Skerritt is still going on. They want him out and they will keep trying from abroad, from the external sources that they have to try to overthrow him, but so far uh, it doesn't look like that's going to be very easy there is. Now, as you've mentioned, the calm and um, we see the, the cruise ship behind you, which is an indication that people are coming to the island and life is back to normal. What was it like on Sunday? We know that the Prime Minister had called on the public to attend church and to postpone uh, celebrations until the following weekend. Exactly. The, the, <clears throat> the Prime Minister called uh, for uh, um, masses to be uh, held together uh, at the same time by all churches except his own, you know, which is uh, the Adventist uh, community which celebrates mass on Saturday. But uh, the rest of the churches um, held these masses uh, calling for reconciliation, for healing the wounds that were opened um, uh, over this uh, uh, turmoil that uh, shaked this country for a few weeks. Uh, that seems to be over, at least for now. Uh, everybody is in a, now in a Christmas mood, actually. People are buying gifts, um, going around shopping, and uh, looking for that celebration. Uh, this is a very religious people, Christian people, who are, for whom this, this uh, the Christmas is a very important issue, uh, date. So. Uh, there is no mood now in the country for violence and there is a mood for this, uh, you know, people are celebrating that the ship came in. Last night everybody was very excited but also anxious. They didn't know exactly whether this would happen, but it did happen and uh, this is the island when I arrived here about over a week ago. This is the island I, I saw and I'm seeing it again. There is. 
And uh, with regards to the opposition, the, uh, Lennox Linton has said that he will not accept the results of the elections. And we have all the election observers saying the elections were actually free and fair. So have we heard anything about them in response to the OAS actually disagreeing with them and saying that the elections was free and fair? All Lennox Linton has said uh, <clears throat> was a video that was so, uh, apparently made of, from his own home in which he said that the OAS and the other missions were unable to see the huge uh, fraud that was uh, happening. Um, it seems that, uh, you know, yesterday we interviewed somebody, the, the one observer, and he said political uh, officials, when they lose, they try to you know, put up a face in which uh, they, they, they did lose, not because they were not popular, but because somebody uh, cheated. <coughs> and, you know, get more or less position for the next election. It seems that that's uh, what's happening here. The Lennox Clinton seems to be pretty isolated, even within his own party. We, are, um, the, we have no reactions for, for example, the um, uh, concerned citizens movement, which is the one, the civil society movement, which promoted an injunction to stop the elections. Uh, we haven't heard from anybody else except Linton and nothing since that statement. Um, it's unlikely or more better impossible that an observer mission in only 252 uh, polling stations would, wouldn't be able to notice huge fraud. They say uh, 8,000 people came over to the island to vote for um, <coughs> uh, Roosevelt's Carrot and the Labour Party, that that was financed by the government. But you know, 8,000 people, you see this ship. The ship is, uh, is bringing about 1,000 people uh, uh, at once. And you notice that people around the city. You will notice 8,000 too. And in order to get those people around here, would take uh, 20 loads of, uh, 22 weeks of loaded planes every day so that uh, they would be able to uh, enter the country because this is a small airport and airplanes can carry only 40 to 50 people. So it, the numbers don't match and it, it's uh, impossible that an observer wouldn't see such a fraud at that scale that Linton is denouncing. So I don't think it is very important what he said. Thank you so much, Alejandro, for joining us and giving us that update as elections came to an end in Dominica on Friday. Now, Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt was sworn in for his new term on Saturday. Uh, President Charles Savarin administered the oath of office. Skerritt's Labour Party won 18 of the 21 seats in Parliament, three more than it had before. I, Roosevelt Skerritt, do swear. I, Roosevelt Skerritt, do swear. That I will fulfill... I will faithfully execute I will, that I will faithfully execute the office of Prime Minister the office of Prime Minister without fear or favor without fear or favor affection or ill will affection or ill will and that in the execution of the functions of that office and that in the execution of the functions of that office I will honor uphold and preserve I will honor uphold and preserve the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Dominica the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Dominica. So help me God. So help me God. They came here to hear just one word, fraud. These were supposed to be their allies, the Organization of American States Observers. Behind all this there was the vivid memory of Bolivia, where a lightning coup of state was based exclusively on an OAS preliminary report. But in Dominica they were prepared. Here with just around 30,000 voters, it was impossible to claim fraud without accurate evidence. Astonished, the bad losers turned into rage. The question I'm asking is this. What is the validity of these elections? And will you say something about whether these elections are valid or not? Major recommendations that were made that you should be looking at and make recommendations to address those two problems. One by one, the electoral missions discarded all complaints. We are here to tell you that we observed the electoral process and that we are satisfied that on election day, the people who voted, their votes 
reflected the will of those who voted. In concluding, it is our considered view that the results reflect the collective will of the people who voted and that the 6th December election was conducted in accordance with the laws of Dominica. Our team visited 200 of the 15 polling stations and none of our members reported any irregularities. After a problem-free polling day, because of these situations, we asked party agents whether they had any observations, complaints, or something to say, and they all said they had no complaints, and that everything was fine. This did not prevent the right-wing candidate from going on with his regime change script, even though walking on moving sands. We are saying to the people of Dominica, we need now to demand fresh elections, because as far as we're concerned, this illegitimate result renders the election null and void, and it renders the government null and void. We not recognize this government. It was this kind of order and tidiness, even in a rural community like this, what neutralized any attempt to delegitimize the process. There was no single complaint from polling stations. Dominicans are a peaceful and religious people, mixing politics, religion, music, and dance. A striking contrast with the opposition calls for war prior to the election day. We will not hypocritically talk peace when the justice of the people of Dominica is being injured and when the rights of the people of Dominica are being set aside. On Friday 6, ballot boxes arrive for the final count, and Dominica's map gradually turns into labor red. Party members began celebrating early. The Prime Minister wasted no time in addressing the nation to prevent last-minute surprises. In communities, families, and at the national level, there must, from tonight, be peace. The essential healing and rebuilding from the events of the last few weeks can only take place in an atmosphere of restraint, respect, and calm. And that is what I call for, restraint, respect, and calm. Next day, and with the Bolivian ghost gone, Skerritt would open up personal feelings to foreign correspondents. It's a vindication. Um, of all of the uh, persecution and attacks and character assassinations and, and, and all of the involvement of uh, a number of external actors in our elections, um, I think uh, this, is a, this is the ultimate vindication uh, in politics. Um, and I, th I think the people, the voters of Dominica, um, recognize that. He also shared some thoughts about the OAS and its Secretary General, Luis Almagro. The OAS has lost its importance and its, its relevance um, and the respect that it has had. And for the OAS to come back to where it was prior to Mr. Almagro taking office, he has to be removed. If he's re-elected, my friend, who will be on to the, um, the Latin America and uh, American group in, and you remember, remember, CELAC was formed because of the issues we have with OAS, eh? Always cautious, Skerritt was sworn in just hours after official results had been published, calmly showing who is in charge in the country. It is probably not the end of all conspiracies, but it is surely a signal of peace, at least for now. Jesús Romero and Alejandro Kirk, Telesur, Dominica. Musicians are standing in solidarity with Colombia's national strike. Stay with us as we unpack this and more. Welcome back. Bolivia's de facto government is now banning the use of traditional indigenous attire for officials on diplomatic duty. The administration of de facto President Janine Añez has sent a memo to all staff at the foreign ministry. It says men must wear dark suits and ties and women should wear suits with pants or a skirt. 
During the government of President Evo Morales, indigenous women staff used their traditional long skirts known as poeras. And men often wore traditional shirts without ties as a sign of respect uh, for indigenous culture. Embroidered ponchos are also now forbidden. Moving on, this Monday is the last day in office for Argentina's right-wing president Mauricio Macri. On Tuesday, Alberto Fernandez and Cristina Fernandez will be sworn in as president and vice president. Edgardo Esteban reports. We're at the end of a cycle here in Argentina with the last day of President Mauricio Macri's government. He's not made any self-criticism in his final appearances, and that includes a 45-minute documentary shown yesterday in which Mauricio Macri presented the key moments of his presidency, but it didn't acknowledge the profound crisis in which he leaves Argentina. One symbolic sign of the change can be seen here in the Plaza de Mayo, They've taken down the barriers that separated the square, where the mothers of the disappeared, for example, always marched, from the presidential palace behind. So today, it becomes once again a square for all the people. And this shows the expectations here for the swearing-in of Alberto Fernandez, which will take place tomorrow at 11 a.m. in the Congress. After that, at 6 o'clock in the evening, there will be a party for the people here in the square with both Alberto Fernandez and Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner taking part to celebrate the beginning of this progressive government which is generating so many expectations amongst the people of Argentina. That was Edgardo Esteban with that report. The main streets of Bogota turned into a giant stage at the weekend, where famous Colombian musicians performed in support of the national strike that has lasted more than three weeks. More protests and stoppages are planned for the coming days. This is where people usually come to practice sports on Sundays. Now it's a stage for artists to protest. In this song for Colombia, actors and more than 40 groups, including well-known singers, joined the national strike. We are here as a part of the strike, giving courage to it, believing that if we unite, we are stronger. We must unite to fight, because we want a better country, a better present for everyone. Thousands have come to accompany them. They are expressing their dissatisfaction with the situation in the country and with politicians who they believe are undermining peace, like the former president, Álvaro Uribe. We have come together because we believe that we have many reasons to march. We believe that the protest is just because it is not a matter of the right or left, or of political parties. We are here for dignity, because we believe that people have to be heard. Artists and citizens demanding better health and education and no more murders of social leaders, no more violence. The mobile stage traveled seven kilometers, raising their voices through music. We want the government to adopt a different attitude. We want people who are willing to listen and change things because the people are asking them in a peaceful and non-violent way. In this way, we support what is going on and want to keep people's spirits up. There is no sign of the strike coming to an end. New demonstrations are planned in the coming days. With pot banging pants and other protests, demanding respect for human rights, the environment, diversity, and economic improvements. In Africa, Sudan has reduced the number of troops in its military contingent deployed in Yemen to 5,000. Sudanese Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok announced the decision on Sunday. For his part, the chairman of the Supreme Yemeni Revolutionary Committee, Mohammed Ali al houthi said that Sudan's decision to remove its soldiers from Yemen is a positive step that prevents further bloodshed. Sudan joined Saudi Arabia's attack on Yemen, launched in 2015, contributing to a humanitarian crisis in which more than 17 million people are at risk of starvation according to the United Nations. 
But the truth is there isn't a military solution to the Yemeni problem. At the end, it will be a political solution. Thousands of Algerian youths have continued to protest against the ruling elites and upcoming elections. The youths are not happy with the holding of elections scheduled for December 12th, since most of the candidates come from the old administration. Algerians have been demonstrating twice a week since February, which led to the resignation of the former president, Abdelaziz Bouteflika. After his resignation, protesters kept on striking, calling for all the officials who worked under him to resign. I think it's a continuity of the system, since the heads are the heads of the old system that was rejected by the population. Moreover, it's empty political programs. So here we talk about things that are unachievable. With our economy, it's like selling dreams to little kids. Coming up, Russia and Ukraine discuss conflict resolution and protests continue to arrest France. Don't move. Welcome back. The Russian President Vladimir Putin and his Ukrainian counterpart Vladimir Zelensky are holding their first face-to-face -face meeting to discuss the conflict in eastern Ukraine. President Putin was welcomed to the summit in Paris by the French President Emmanuel Macron, who was hosting the talks. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel is also helping to mediate. The aim is to put an end to the fighting in the region, which has continued for over five years and claimed at least 13,000 lives. Staying in France, the transport system remains crippled as the nationwide anti-government strike goes into its fifth day. Commuters struggle to get to work as most of the transport system was shut down on Monday. The workers are expressing their anger at the government's plan to change the pension system. Monday will again be an extremely complicated day for all of our passengers, as the network will still be extremely disrupted. We are talking about 15 to 20 percent of the traffic. It means a slight improvement, but which does not correspond at all to the needs of a Monday. At least five people are confirmed dead and over 20 are missing after a volcanic eruption hit a New Zealand tourist destination. About 50 tourists were believed to be on the island when the eruption happened. 23 were rescued and it is feared no one else survived the eruption. A no-fly zone has been declared over the area. It is a no-fly zone at the island at the moment and uh, we will continue to update you on the events as they unfold. But again, can I just say our thoughts are absolutely with the friends and family of those that are injured and those that have died. At least 43 people were killed in a factory fire in New Delhi, India. The fire broke out early on Sunday in the city's old quarter, where many small manufacturing and storage units are located. Officials said the number of casualties is expected to rise as several others remain seriously injured. The cause of the fire has not yet been established and investigations are ongoing. My first rescuers went inside with a SCBA, with an oxygen cylinder, and they checked the, if there is any hazardous gas or not. We found there is no hazardous gas, only carbon monoxide content was a little bit high, so uh, because the room was closed. And after some time, uh, uh, thereafter, the other team for rescue operations went inside and they carry out the search and rescue operation. And staying in India, demonstrators clashed with police during a protest over the rape and murder of a 23-year-old woman. Police used water cannons to disperse protesters as outrage over the murder flared across the country. After being raped by a gang of men, the victim was then set on fire, eventually dying at a New Delhi hospital. The attack is the second major case of violence against women recorded in India within the past two weeks. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. 
For our viewers in Africa, remember you can find us on Stats at Channel 461 in South Africa and Channel 539 in Nigeria. And join us on social media. For Talisir English, I'm Doris Polo. Thank you so much for watching.